So there's a story we tell ourselves about risk. Uh, risk as a way of thinking, a type of rationality, an epistemology. And the story goes something like this. The 19th century was governed by a concept of individual responsibility and blame. Uh, the model that dominated was one that we could call juridical, a, a legal model uh, that sought, in the case of wrongdoing, uh, to place individual responsibility. Toward the end of the 19th century, that model of individual responsibility and blame was displaced by the concept of risk, of accident, and social insurance. Michel Foucault traced this shift in several works, uh, including in his lecture about the concept of the dangerous individual in 19th century legal psychiatry in 1978, in his lectures, Secure Territory Population in 78, and in the birth of biopolitics in 79. As well, and he elaborated them as well in uh, his Louvain lectures, Malfaire d'Ivray, or Wrongdoing Truth Telling, The Function of the Avowal in Justice, uh, in 1981. And what he elaborated was what he called, quote, an important transformation in civil law at the beginning of the 19th century, and at the, at the end of the 19th century, and at the beginning of the 20th century. And this transformation revolved around the notion of accident, risk, and responsibility. It was a shift that would ultimately produce a depenalization, uh, a removal of guilt uh, from civil responsibility. He wrote, to cut it off from any reference to subjective fault, to release it of the burden to demonstrate the existence of a personal fault. Concretely, in the case of work accidents, it was necessary that the workers who suffered during an accident be given indemnities without having to prove that their boss had committed a specific fault or violation of a law or of a precise regulation. In short, the problem was to establish a no-fault responsibility in law. Now, the reference text for this, uh, for this shift, uh, naturally, is François Eval's uh, dissertation and brilliant book, uh, L'État Providence, published in 1986, uh, that focused on the emergence of risk and the institution of workmen's compensation laws uh, at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and the theme was also developed uh, by Robert Castel in La Gestion des Risques, uh, as well some by Jacques Donzelot in L'Invention du Social. The notion, of course, was spreading risk, a movement, towards, a movement towards a certain social solidarity, using probabilities, decolpabilization, and the idea of no fault. That's the world as we knew it. That's the story we tell ourselves. During the course of the 20th century, uh, that probabilistic paradigm, that risk equilibrium, splintered in many directions. And since that time, there have been several developments. Um, I would like to propose five here based on the works of François Wald, Pat O'Malley, and Caitlin Zloom. There was a turn to re-individualization uh, of risk. Uh, you see this beginning in the 1920s actually with uh, Ernest Burgess's work on prediction, individual prediction and individual outcomes uh, and notions of future dangerousness. Using risk not to spread acts out among society uh, but to identify dangerous persons. Second, there was a responsabilization of risk. As we identified and as we started to use these predictions, we could use them also to try to change behavior, to impose higher premiums on people who are dangerous, to impose longer sentences. There was an avoidance of risk, um, and this is something that would gradually lead towards uh, the notion of a precautionary principle. Um, that François Evald has written about. Uh, there was a notion of embracing risk, uh, and this is uh, from a collection of work by Tom Baker and Jonathan Simon, um, with uh, contributions from our authors here. Um, but a notion of a kind of a positive attitude uh, toward risk, where uncertainty is viewed as a challenge. And there was also managing risk. Managing risk in terms of the idea of uh, in the work of Pat O'Malley, preparedness, of being prepared for the worst, of managing consequences, or in the work of Caitlin Zaloum, uh, of mitigating, hedging, reducing exposure to risk, uh, particularly in the financial context. All of these changes have carried us into a world that many refer to as post-risk. Um, 
producing new categories uh, based in part on ideas of catastrophe, on ideas of uncertainty, on ideas of low probability, high injury outcomes. Um, and in a world in which we start to think of different perceptions of probability and of harm as not only affecting our forms of rationality, but also as themselves being affected uh, by the dominant ways of thinking in terms of preparedness or precaution, etc. It's not just that the epistemic lens fits the reality, low probability, high harm, but that the perception of low probability, high harm shapes the episteme. Uh, we've seen the effects throughout society today with very different reactions to uh, what can be thought of as security risks. We've seen the effects most recently, for instance, with the Supreme Court's decision in Florence, a case that allows the state to strip search anyone arrested for even a minor crime. It's a, it's a case that in some sense is based on a notion of absolute prevention of even the most low probability minor deviance. The future of risk, which is what we're going to explore today, is in some sense slightly a misnomer, uh, depending on how one thinks about risk. And of course, it's not clear that we are in a post-risk era. But the question is, essentially, what are the dominant forms of thinking about fault and about wrongdoing that are emerging today? We are fortunate to have with us uh, a wonderful group of uh, thinkers uh, from very far away and uh, from here at the University of Chicago as well. Uh, Francois Wald is joining us from Paris um, and will be uh, speaking specifically about notions of kind of uh, large big data, data sets, the accumulation of individual information in large data sets. Uh, Patrick O'Malley is joining us from the University of Sydney uh, and will be talking to us about concepts of resilience as a new way of thinking about um, this post-risk space. And Caitlin Zulum is joining us from New York, uh, and we'll be talking about notions of liquidity, market makers uh, in dealing with or, or, not, um, or not mitigating risk. In addition, we're blessed to have a, an extraordinary group of scholars from the University of Chicago. Uh, Kaushik will be on the panel, but what I'd like to do right now is turn it over to Anwen Tormi, uh, who is uh, the curator of this event and who will say a few words and then introduce our first panel. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Thank you all for turning out early on a Friday morning. Um, I just want to, before I start, actually thank the people who helped make this event possible, beginning with our sponsors. So the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory is one of our main sponsors. The France Chicago Center is another sponsor, and the Norman Wade Harris. Um, we couldn't have done this event without them. Um, OK, so unlike most of the panelists here today that you, you're going to hear from, my work is actually never focused on questions of risk. As a matter of fact, I know almost nothing about the risk literature. And my involvement um, here has exposed me to a fascinating cornucopia of possibilities for thinking concretely about outcomes related to risk assessment and management, the failure to acquire predictable outcomes, dealing with radical and unceasing uncertainty in issues of asylum adjudication. So I wanted to speak to you uh, for a moment. Our, our division of labor this morning was that Bernard would provide a, a, an historical overview, and then my mm -hmm. task um, or my desire was to give you a concrete object to perhaps think with throughout the day. And I thought that I would uh, just sketch briefly the parameters of some of my work so that you can think with me anyway throughout the day about risk and asylum. The Congolese have a phrase for the practice of claiming asylum. Kabwaka in Zoto literally means to fling one's body out into the unknown. This image of taking leave of one's home in order to literally hurl oneself towards the bureaucratic abyss 
and that only if one succeeds in fording the border regimes which protect Europe from such endeavors, poses an ironic contrast, I believe, to the notion of risk which has proliferated in the wake of 9-11 as immigration and securitization have become increasingly conflated. In 2010, 845,000 asylum claims were made globally. South Africa received the largest number of claims, followed by the United States and then France. This number, extraordinary as it is in a single year, says nothing about the 25.2 million people who were already in possession of refugee status in 2010, four-fifths of whom are hosted by developing countries, so not Europe, in other words. So despite the fact that Europe receives such a proportionately small number of refugees, the European Union has, since the mid-1990s, developed a series of restrictive measures aimed at managing this influx. For example, the 1995 Schengen Acquis, which laid the legislative basis for biometric and other information sharing among EU member states, the creation of a common unit, um, an external border police now known as Frontex, the promulgation of legislation which mandates stiff carrier sanctions, increasingly narrow visa regimes, and lastly, the development of plans to concentrate asylum camps extraterritorially. So, for example, in Africa, rather than in the EU, where claims might be processed outside the sovereign territory of the EU itself. Now, these restrictive measures were predominantly the result of various risk assessment analyses which identified asylum seeking and indeed all unwanted labor migration as a threat to Europe's borders. Frontex, for example, which incidentally had a starting budget of 6.2 million euros in 1995 and last year received 83.2 million euros, is so singularly committed to risk analysis that it has developed its own risk analysis model known as CIRAM which relies on a four-tier access control model and a network of par partner states extending all the way to Africa. Now, CIRAM's goal is to maximize effectiveness in preventing cross-border crime, at least this is how it describes itself, and ensure the security of EU's external borders by predicting future trends and proposing remedies. In practice, however, um, the majority of these remedies actually take the form of prevention and removal. Though Frontex has in the past characterized what some might objectively consider negative outcomes, for example, the deportation of an asylum seeker, as a positive good for both sending and receiving countries. In other words, it's deploying risk management rationale in every conceivable situation in which it must act um, and conceives of its actions uh, along the European border as, and this is actually a quote, safeguarding the creative entrepreneurs of sending countries, thereby, thereby preventing brain drain and saving their citizens from smugglers, traffickers, and risky clandestine border crossings. So it's a really uh, interesting uh, twist on um, what uh, this police force actually thinks that they're doing. So despite the insights into the world of risk thinking which have become available th to me through working on this conference topic, the saturation of an ethical legal regime such as asylum protection by a variety of risk-related calculations has remained unsettling for me, despite the fact that I accept that everyday life involves more or less complicated, more or less abstract risk thought. So during my work with asylum adjudicators and asylees in Ireland, it was abundantly clear that a calculus of risk was at play on both sides. UNHCR trained low-level civil servants came to act as refugee experts weighing probability against risk. The probability that the asylee standing before them was telling the truth versus the risk um, to that asylee and to the integrity of the state's asylum regime if they refuse their claim and return them to a situation of danger in their country of origin. Asylum seekers, in turn, fretted about the most effective ways to craft their testimony, painfully aware that fear is often culturally specific, that trauma can be invisible, that sincerity is hard to maintain within the repet repetitive strictures of asylum bureaucracy. And moreover, that many of the fears that compel Africans to leave their homes are not in practice admissible under the terms of the post-war Geneva Convention. Thus, despite the appearance of mutual risk management, or at least risk calculation, 
The outcome of these encounters was in practice quite unpredictable, and for me as an anthropologist, really challenging to try and think through. So for one thing, the evolution of Irish bureaucracy and legislation under neoliberal conditions has resulted in a situation wherein much of the procedure, policy, and even um, legislation that asylees encounter during the adjudication process remains underdeveloped and overly discretionary. Such poorly defined legislative and bureaucratic moments have two potentially damaging outcomes. The first is an undue reliance by adjudicators on the credibility of asylum seekers' testimony. And the second is a corrosive suspicion on the part of those asylees that decision-making rationales are unclear and seemingly arbitrary. And it is this perception that fuels despair and desperation for asylees and is in turn the source of much anxiety on the part of case workers. So there's a kind of a dialectic of anxiety and fear that, that I think is moving between asylum seekers and case workers and that is somehow um, um, entangled in risk. And, and untangling and thinking through that is, is one of the things that I'm hoping to do with this conference. So for example, Maksud, a Pakistani man who was fleeing a blasphemy indictment, told me about the denial of his claim following an initial interview with the man he characterized as hostile. Quote, I could see it, you see, he knew nothing about Pakistan. He knew nothing about my faith, my religion, he knew nothing. I could just see his uh, body language. The moment I was told he was going to interview me, that day he was having a very, very bad flu and he was not at all well. He shouldn't have come that day, I would say. And I could see this in the way he was questioning me. When I came out, I told my wife, no, it's not going to work. I could see it on him, I could smell him. Similarly, during a tour to the Office of Refugee Applications in Dublin, I asked Tomas, an asylum adjudicator, what the panic buttons on the interview rooms were for. We've had asylum seekers hide razor blades in their mouths and threaten to harm themselves if it looks like their case is not going well, he replied, holding my gaze as if to see how I received this piece of information. A few years earlier, Tomas and his colleagues had gone on strike closing the doors of the refugee office on hundreds of asylum seekers who were left to mill about in the rain under the glare of national TV cameras. Their civil service union, Impact, stated that there were concerns about their safety, as well as the safety of the refugees using the center. Tomas told me that many of his colleagues were ex-police, teachers, and civil servants from other areas who had requested to be transferred to the refugee union, so they were initially sympathetic. However, after a few years of applying UNHCR's criteria of internal consistency, external credibility, and overall plausibility to the thousands of cases and the growing quota demands upon their caseload, he and many of his colleagues had become what I call presumptively skeptical, a condition which can be said to introduce either radical uncertainty or endless uncertainty in their interviewees. Now, the complexities involved in thinking through the permutations of what ma one might call a jurisprudence of doubt, which is crystallized around the figure of the asylee, remain a challenge for me. And I look forward to thinking with you all today, not only about modeling risk, but also about how, how examining how these models are worked out in practice. Thank you. Um, and now I'd like to invite our uh, first presenter, uh, Professor Pat O'Malley. He is the Pro Professorial Research Fellow and previously was the Canada Research Chair in Criminology and Criminal Justice in Ottawa. Most of his work has focused on issues of risk and security, especially, especially in relation to crime prevention, drug harm minimization, insurance, and insurance law. Um, he... Um, one of his major books is uh, a monograph on the currency of justice, a recent paper on this issue focusing on the impact of monetization and informatics on key areas of justice, was awarded the 2010 Red Zinowitz Prize by the British Journal of Criminology for the article which in that year made the greatest contribution to the development of criminology. He's been awarded various professional honors, including the American Society of Criminology's Sheldon and Eleanor Gluck Award for contributions, 
and has held distinguished lectureships at Amherst College, the University of Toronto, Leipzig University, New York University, and Victoria University in Wellington. Please join me in welcoming Pat O'Malley. What I'm going to be talking about, the first part of the talk will be about some of the models alternative to risk that have developed, especially uh, in post 9-11 environments. And, and then... Oh, sure. It's down there, I think. I think that's where Unwin said it was, but we can run it off the thumb drive. Okay. It seems a better off. Now, uh, the, where was it? Oh, yeah. Um, but I got interested in all of this in the kinds of subject and the kinds of subjectification that have gone along with changes since uh, a period when, at least as far as most of our research was concerned, risk was the name of the game. What shifts have begun to occur in the ways in which uh, subjects are imagined or subjects are going to be created. Um, now, it goes without saying, a starting point very quickly is, of course, that by risk, I mean what Stephen Collier and Andy Lakoff have called um, a, a combination of statistical and archival knowledge. So we use the build-up of archival knowledge, apply the laws of large numbers to them, and produce specific uh, predictions. And that model has two characteristics. Uh, one is that it's threat specific, and the other is that allegedly, at least, it is statistically precise. Uh, it, it focuses in, whether we're talking about terrorism, whether we're talking about medicine, it focuses in specifically on kinds of risk, so that a prediction is very specific, a specific subtype of cancer, or a specific form of hacking into computers, um, and that, that in some senses, has proven to be one of risk's vulnerabilities. Um, what happens when, for example, targets become much more diffuse and it becomes more difficult? Uh, and secondly, what happens when uh, targets are being constructed innovatively and we cannot rely on the batteries of archival information that we have up to now relied upon to produce uh, models of risk. So, uh, I'm kind of walking around the thing. The, the, having said that, um, okay, um, I'm sorry, this, this is still a bit of a problem here. Oh, I see, hang on. Oh, okay, good, I, I've got it now. Um, all right, so that's that first is preventative risk. Um, there have been some innovations more recently, and strictly speaking, this last one from Louise and Moore doesn't belong under risk at all because it is what more to do with what I would call uncertainty. That Louise and Moore decided to say, well, under the banner of risk, much more speculative models are being introduced. Her work focuses on immigration scans uh, in relation to, in particular, terrorism threats. She said what's happened there is they've borrowed models from areas such as derivatives, so that little fragments of information are taken, and these fragments might be changed on a day-to-day -day basis um, to locate possible problems. They might be, so you would build in a, an, an, uh, a kind of um, formula, which says, okay, if you have been to Dubai in the last year, if you've paid cash for your ticket, and uh, if you have no checked baggage, we'll pull you in for questioning. Notice it's not predictive, it doesn't say anything other than these are people we will get further information from. It's a model of uncertainty. But the primary developments, I think, that have certainly been around for a very long mm -hmm. time, but have received much more uh, attention since 9-11 you could say demonstrated some shortcomings in risk, have been, I think, three primarily in number. The first, preparedness, and Andy Lakoff and Stephen Collier's work, which focuses on the idea that we may not be able to predict the future, but we can imagine likely scenarios. So we create scenarios and we then 
deal with, we work out ways of dealing with them. It, it's, an, it's a development out of the classic model of wargaming, where we will predict battles and we fight them through. And so when the problem arrives, when the disaster appears on our doorstep, we have certain models in place. We don't know with any, uh, any precision which of these models is likely to appear, but at least we have something in place. So it's based on imagination. There are multiple uh, imagined threats. It is largely reactive, but it is not probabilistic. Um, I'll go in slightly reverse order here. Precaution, of course, which most people would be familiar with from Francois's work um, and the recent work of Cass Sunstein and Michel Clermont. One model of precaution is that, that we, can, we focus on worst case scenarios. We have no idea how likely these are, but their consequences are so bad that we have to intervene. And the precautionary model says where at least we're dealing with, say, for example, uh, scientific research, that because the unknown consequences could be of such a magnitude, then we will put a break on. We will regulate, stop if necessary, further development. Uh, Cass Sunstein calls these the laws of fear. Um, Michel Callon and his uh, colleagues in, in a very interesting book called Acting in an Uncertain World reject that approach and say that precaution is much more about a stimulus to develop knowledge, a stimulus to develop new kinds of knowledge through which to govern the uncertain world and they borrow some phrases and terms from Beck such as the democratization of risk to talk about ways in which new knowledges can be brought to bear. And last but not least, uh, speculative preemption uh, by my colleague at Sydney, uh, Melinda Cooper, who says, well, speculative preemption, of which I suppose you could say the wars in Iraq uh, is a good example, is, is nothing new. Uh, there have been plenty of preemptive moves in the past where we uh, have reason to suppose there is a danger, we intervene in order to cancel out the danger. But she says, what's new about speculative preemption uh, is that we go in without any idea of what the risk is that we are attacking, or rather, to put it more precisely, we're totally uncertain uh, about this risk. Let us say weapons <coughs> of mass destruction. And the evidence is unclear, but the consequences, if there are weapons of mass destruction, are so huge that instead of adopting a precautionary mode, we will go in and we will strike first. So that, in a sense, uncertainty, rather than paralyzing action, can become a trigger for action. Now, what interests me and others about all three of these models is that, as the Canadian scholar Engin Eisen has argued, they tend to focus on the idea of a neurotic subject a subject driven by anxiety who, whose anxiety is framed around insecurity and oriented toward the production of maximum security. Um, it is a very negative subjectivity and that is a subject that comes through, I think, uh, for example, in Ulrich Beck's image of risk consciousness where people are constantly uh, thinking in terms of the risks to themselves or to... Uh, uh, what they have investments, moral, political, and economic in. But over, certainly beginning in, well, beginning actually in the 1970s with the environmental movement, accelerating away in the last decade has been something which is rather diff different to everything I've talked about. Uh, and that is a model of resilience. And that resilience, which is a term now applied to all sorts of things. We have resilient infrastructures, resilient economies, resilient states, resilient uh, nations, and we now have, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, resilient individuals. Resilience implies something different. First off, it's not threat specific. The threat itself is not necessarily mentioned. The point about resilience is that it is a capacity, a developed capacity to withstand shock. The nature of that shock is unspecified. It is a way of creating a stable subject 
in the face of radical uncertainty. And uh, Lenzos and Rose, for example, in their paper on resilience uh, from a couple of years ago in Economy and Society, uh, argue precisely that. Um, they look, I think, from memory at the varieties of resilient resiliency programs set up by European governments. Um, but you can see that this is a model, post-risk model for uncertainty, that it doesn't, it's not threat specific. It does not rely upon, therefore, statistical data. It doesn't make probabilistic assumptions. It says, whatever happens, whatever disaster befalls us, we will be able to withstand it. And one of the things that, that about this paper that fascinated me was this last little section that I've put into bright blue. A logic of resiliency would aspire to create a subjective and systematic state to enable each and all uh, to live freely and with confidence in a world of potential risks. Because this is not a neurotic subject. It, there is a break here. This is a subject who can live freely and with confidence in this world of high uncertainty. And, and so I began to look into some of the ways in which resiliency has been developed. And, and the paper I'll talk about today will focus on two linked ones. Um, which have been developed in relation to business and law. Now, I say business and law because one of the features of, of the new military, what the military post what they call the revolution in military affairs, the RMA, is something rather different to the old model of a fixed battle with disciplined, obedient soldiers following orders. And the new model is something more, you might say, enterprising. And it emerges, and I'll talk about it a little more in a second, out of uh, increasing recognition on the part of military thinkers that, the, that warfare needs to model itself on business, on enterprise, because business is driven by the market uh, of necessity, a structure and a set of assemblages and operations which thrives in highly uncertain environments. And therefore the military have said, we need to look to business for models for how we should develop ourselves. And good old Donald Rumsfeld, who can always be relied upon, some sort of quote comes up, as you might predict, <laughs> to say, well, what we need is actually not the old style of bureaucratic soldier. We need a new style of soldier who is an entrepreneur. Or oh, incidentally, if you read this network-centric warrior and uh, RMA literature, you, you don't talk about soldiers anymore, you talk about warriors. Um, we need warriors uh, who aren't in that old model of obedient and loyal and trustworthy and follow orders and so on. That's all in there, but we need rather venture capitalists. We need warriors who are going to thrive in an environment of high uncertainty because that's what warfare has become. Warfare is no longer what it used to be. Warfare can occur on the internet. We have to be adaptable. We have to be flexible. Our warriors have to be adaptable. They have to thrive in a, a much less predictable environment than was true for the old model of platform-based, silo-structured warfare. Now this, in turn, leads to something else because Certainly once upon a time, things like resiliency were thought to be just something we had, like courage. We either had it or we didn't have it. It was put into us in school and a deep structure of the self, or we didn't have it. And in our previous paper, I've explored the way the military shifted from that old model to a new model. But the new model is based on a different idea of resilience and resilient subjects. That resilience is something that is learned. Resilience is moreover something that can be researched. This quote comes from a, it's a very small part of a huge literature in cognitive behavioural psychology. Um, and cognitive behavioural psychology has been precisely about the scientific development of ways of behaving and ways of thinking and acting that are more effective, are more efficient. And one of the things they have been focusing upon has been this idea precisely of resilience. Now, 
The reason I raised this point about business and the military is that there is and has been for quite a long while a, a quite big literature on, on resiliency in business and other structures. And it's bled out, of course, those of you who spend a lot of time, like I do, in airports, have probably hung around airport bookshops. And airport bookshops are a fabulous place for picking up books like The Resiliency Advantage, The Resiliency Factor, The Power of Resilience, and so on. And, and rather than treat these books as jokes, you need to recognize that they are, in fact, the tip of an iceberg. They are, uh, if you like, indications of a fundamental shift in thinking that is going on, in which a lot of the stuff here, and notice they're not talking about handling disasters or whatever, they're saying it makes a difference between surviving and thriving. It's the basic ingredient to happiness and success. This is, whatever it is, is a technology that fits in with Len Soss and Rose, about making individuals who are free and confident in an uncertain environment. These resiliency manuals are, if you like, the tip of an iceberg. And they show, uh, there's a whole business sector on this, they show one part of that. The other part of that, which I'm interested in, going back to what I was saying about the nexus, the new version of Eisenhower's military industrial complex, is, is the military. Because the military, and especially but not only the American military, has shifted big time to resiliency training. So that now every US soldier undergoes uh, resiliency training. Every US military unit has a resiliency trainer. I mean, this is big times. It's big bucks. It's a major change. And the aim is to create supermen and superwomen. And it does so not on the basis of, uh, I should say, it is in itself in it, not on the basis of just talk but on the basis a lot of a lot of, uh, especially but not only, lab-based research on what makes people able to withstand stress. So the Fort Bragg program, which is the basic program for the US military, breaks resiliency down into a bunch of uh, training modules. You've got to have positive emotions, you have to have cognitive flexibility, you have to have coping style, you have spirituality and so on. And these aren't there out of some ideological model. They're there because research has shown all these things assist in dealing with high uncertainty. So spirituality, for example, including religion, isn't there because God is a moral imperative and every soldier had better believe in God because that's crucial. It's there because, in a sense, God is now enlisted as a technology of resilience. People who believe in some spiritual thing will be more resilient. Therefore, uh, whether you know, that is Alcoholics Anonymous or whether it's Allah doesn't matter in the slightest. It is that you have that spirituality. So these elements then, which once upon a time might have been seen as character traits, are now seen as modules in a training model. And each one, so going back to just one of those, the coping style, in turn is broken down into specific uh, things. Gad you must learn how to gather information, acquire skills, use confrontation rather than avoidance. You have to learn problem solving. You have to engage social support and so on. So it's a very practical training course. And it's a practical training course, to cut a very long story short, aimed at producing resilient subjects. Subjects who uh, are capable of withstanding high conditions of uncertainty, who will not only be prepared for a specific disaster and will not only bounce back after a specific disaster, but will thrive on this. And will, in the language of the new military, very neo-Darwin, be able to adapt to new fitness landscapes. So there is this idea, the world is changing. We don't know how it's going to change, but it's changing big time. Our military, like our business, has to be adapted to withstand these shocks. And these are the, the new subjects, not the neurotic subject. These are the new subjects who, at least in the imagination of these programs, 
of quotes enable each and all to live freely and with confidence in a world of potential risks. Okay, thanks very much. I'll leave it there. So our, our next speaker is Professor Koshik Sundararajan. He is an Associate Professor of Anthropology and of Social Sciences in the college. Um, he is the author of a, uh, a number of articles and books. Um, I'll just mention a few. In 2005, um, he published Subjects of Speculation, Emergent Life Sciences and Market Logics in the US and India. That was published in American Anthropologist. In 2006, his book, Biocapital, The Constitution of Post-Genomic Life, was published by Duke University Press. And his forthcoming book is entitled Lively Capital, Biotechnology, Ethics and Governance in Global Markets, and that will be published by Duke University. Please join me in welcoming Professor Koshik Sundararajan. Thanks, and thanks very much to, to um, Bernard and, and Wenford asking me to comment on this. Um, so I want to um, this so I want to have this quote up in the background as I ask some questions about neoliberal subjectivity. I will begin by probing what is the neoliberal in Patrick O'Malley's paper and what is subject constitution? And for me, the absences in the paper what does the former have to do with capital and the latter with the hermeneutics of subjectivity? Neoliberalism is posited by O'Malley in terms of a certain mode of imagining the future that has to be bureaucratized. But what is neoliberalism here and where are the logics of capital in relation to which this bureaucratic rationality materializes? Here, reading Melinda Cooper is worthwhile. O'Malley reads her 2006 essay, Preempting Emergence, but I wish to read her remarkable 2008 book, Life is Surplus, where some of these arguments are fleshed out in more elaborate form. For Cooper, understanding neoliberalism involves first tracing logics of capital, specifically the inherent drive of capital towards surplus as part of the ontology of capital itself. Though of course, how this drive might manifest is always historically specific. And second, there are epistemologies of neoliberal economics which Cooper reads in her book alongside epistemologies of the life sciences over the past four decades. Neoliberalism, for her, is the specific conjunctural conjoining of logics of capital with epistemologies of economics in particular places, especially the United States, which is the empirical focus of her work, and times. O'Malley suggests that resilience might be a more significant category of futurity that emerges out of a neoliberal governmentality than speculative preemption, which is what Cooper focuses on in preempting emergence. But speculative preemption for Cooper is not in any simple sense that which neoliberal governmentality is. Rather, she is interested in how speculative preemption emerges as a governmental logic in a specific conjuncture, which sees the playing out of value logics of capital in relation to emergent epistemologies of economics and the life sciences. Neoliberalism, in this context, only emerges out of this conjuncture. There is no a priori governmental rationality as such outside of these histories. Further, Cooper is absolutely concerned with the affective politics that this mobilizes. This too is a critical Marxian inheritance. She sees Marx's notion of the fetish of the commodity as something that is both consequent to and that drives value logics of capital. What she suggests is that in today's hyper-speculative capitalism, the more accurate descriptor is a capitalist delirium. The way in which this delirium manifests changes, for instance, between the Clinton and the second Bush administrations, mobilizing different affective registers. And so she contrasts the megalomaniacal delirium for innovation that marked the Clinton years to the delirium of fear-mongering that marked the governance of the neocons, and that finds its place in documents like the National Security Strategy of 2002 that O'Malley refers to. But critically, she sees these as contiguous and continuous with one another. I wish to suggest, contrary to O'Malley, that Cooper does not see neoliberalism and neoconservatism as, to quote, a succession of strategies. Neoconservatism is, for her, a particular contingent manifestation of a broader trajectory of neoliberalism 
that is not rupture. And further, this broad, broader trajectory itself is a function of a particular conjoining of value logics of capital with epistemic emergence and affective politics. And one sees a similarly conjoint construction of the neoliberal in Jean and John Komarov's work on crime statistics in South Africa as well. Marx, Cooper, and the Komarovs all insist that no governmental rationality can be posited independent of the historicities of their emergence. I wish to keep that in mind as I ask about the question of the subject. O'Malley speaks of subjectivity in relation to subject constitution. What is the relationship of the subject constitution, however, to what one might call a hermeneutics of subjectivity, to subjectivity as lived experience? I am not posing this question as some kind of a demand for an unmediated access to the ethnographic reality of lived experience. Rather, again in a Marxian vein, I am asking this question as a historicist one, and indeed as a post-colonial one. Simply put, when the constitution of the liberal slash neoliberal subject through rationalities of governance is described, not just by O'Malley, but more generally in Foucauldian scholarship, it seems assumed that the subject in question is the advanced liberal subject. But being an advanced liberal subject is, for all of the subjectifications of neoliberal governmentality, ultimately a rather privileged subject position, even if it is one that is being constantly reconstituted in inconvenient ways. The violence of neoliberalism, and precisely the violence of neoliberal capital, is often disproportionately directed against those who are not able to opt out of these regimes, but who are never allowed properly to opt into them in the first place. So let me posit a somewhat different register of risk and resilience that might be worth thinking about. At the moment, I am in the process of writing about the experimental subject of clinical trials. I too am interested in subject constitution, but I suggest that subject constitution is never purely a function of governmental rationality, but always of the intersections of rationalities of power with the historically specific conditions of possibility for those rationalities to touch down in unequal and disproportionate ways. Hence, I'm interested in how the experimental subject of early stage clinical trials in a place like India, while constructed by liberal medical ethics as a rational autonomous individual who signifies that autonomy by signing an informed consent form, is in fact invariably someone who has been subject to prior violence or dispossession. I've written earlier about the relationship between deproletarianization and experimental subjectivation as unemployed mill workers from the disintegrating textile industry in Bombay or unemployed diamond workers from the disintegrating diamond industry in Surat end up becoming recruited into clinical trials. I am now following the case of Bhopal, where gas victims of the Bhopal gas tragedy and their kin have become experimental subjects in clinical trials in the very same hospital that was set up as part of the court settlement to provide care for them. Clinical trials are risky, especially early stage trials on healthy volunteers. And the irony indeed of framing victims of the world's worst industrial disaster as healthy is not even worth remarking upon. It involves the administration of an experimental therapeutic molecule into a human body to test for its toxic effects. The capacity building for global clinical trials in India is undoubtedly driven by the Indian government, but is very much in response to globalizing logics of biocapital, which sees the appropriation of health by capital, but also, like all capital, requires the labor of those who can be excluded, of those who are expendable, of those who can be made bioavailable, and those who have already been violated by prior moments of global capitalism. Let us remember why the gas victims of Bhopal became gas victims in the first place. I will not say more about this except to suggest that the resilience of lived experience in the face of the violence of global capital often pre-exists the resilient subject that is constructed by neoliberal governmental rationality. I am not arguing for some other kind of subjectivity that operates in the third world as opposed to the first. Gas victims, unemployed mill workers, and experimental subjects for global clinical trials are all subjects of global capital, even if not necessarily always in its neoliberal guise. I am also not arguing for some hierarchy of subjectivation. Measuring the suffering of subjectivation is not what is at stake here. Rather, I want to ask how does one account for the subjectivities of those who are radically dispossessed and who are included in circuits of global neoliberal capital, indeed form the conditions of possibility for global neoliberal capital, but who are also excluded from the privileges of advanced liberal subjectivity or biopolitics that we enjoy. When I was in Bhopal, I had a chat with Santosh. Santosh is 14. He knows of no life before the Bhopal gas disaster. 
we had just come out of a meeting of gas survivors who were planning a rail roco, an agitation that would involve them lying on railway tracks to stop trains going through Bhopal for the 28th anniversary of the Bhopal gas disaster. Most of the victims of the Bhopal gas disaster know of the clinical trials taking place on them. One told me to quote, we don't go to the hospital anymore. They do trials there, so when we go, we come out dead, close quote. Many of the people in the meeting that Santosh and I were at were women in their 80s who were explaining to others the bodily techniques of lying on railway tracks, how to hold hands together, how to become flaccid when the police come so that they would find it difficult to lift you, how to come back to the tracks once removed, how to congregate. Santosh and I walked. There was a lake nearby, but it was bright green, toxic sludge. Santosh said that no water that the slum dwellers drink in, is untainted by chemicals and poison. All the water that their animals drink is poison. Toxic subjectivity in the slums of Bhopal near the erstwhile Union Carbide plant is not the function of a single disastrous event. It is a daily condition of existence. The clinical trials just constitute the circle of poison that constitutes the subjectivities of those who survive and live and die in Bhopal. Santosh told me as we were talking that he wants to become a biologist when he grows up because he wants to do research that can improve the health of people like his who live in the slums. The incongruity of the situation still staggers me, of lives that have been lived in their entirety, in toxicity, in ways that word make words like risk seem almost meaningless, of the imagination of a hospital as a space to be avoided because it is a space of trials and death, and of a boy who nonetheless wants to be a biologist so that he can do research that will improve the health of his people. My question to Patrick is, how does this concept of resilience that emerges in neoliberal governance account for the lived resilience of Santosh, of Rashida B, who has lost most of her relatives to cancer, of Bhopal. What does that kind of subject constitution, the subject constitution that is constitutive to the everyday violence of global neoliberal capital, have to do with the constitution of the resilient subject of neoliberal government rationality? I end also with a question to myself, to ourselves. Ultimately, all I'm saying is that we cannot, should not, Talk about risk without remembering that the underprivileged always face disproportionate amounts of risk. Yet somehow, there seems to be no place for them in our philosophies. But my own critique comes from the privilege of liberal subjectivity, no doubt inconvenienced by neoliberal regimes, and the claim that I am making simply is that my liberally positioned emphasis on disproportionate risk is what distinguishes me. I think we need to ask ourselves about the conditions of possibility and impossibility of a progressive politics against neoliberalism, given the comfortable liberal positions from which we can launch our critiques, and then ask what theory, critique, and praxis might mean for us today. Thanks. That modern criminology, which is one of the fields I spend most of my time in, um, is almost entirely focused on the crime, actually mostly in the Anglophone world, uh, but also Europe. Uh, and that um, it therefore has almost no purchase for large uh, domains of criminology that are not, in a sense, external to criminology itself. So insofar as the governance of crime deals with the governance of uh, the subjects of post-colonialism, for example, in Australia, this means the Aboriginal population who are uh, grotesquely disproportionately part of the criminal justice system cannot be understood with the tools that criminology itself develops. So I, I'm acutely aware, aware of that problem. And I think I'm not sure whether there, there are two questions here, but, but let, me, let me perhaps uh, put, put something that might be um, interpreting uh, Koshik's paper in, in a particular way. But uh, it sets up a new domain of questioning, uh, and which you have begun to explore, which is, well, what is the relationship between these subjectifications? And if we want to, we could say native. I mean, native in the broad sense of the word subjectifications. How do these uh, confront each other? Another question, which I think is perhaps not raised here, but and how do these account for the forms of, of resistance, or how do they uh, help to account for the forms of politics that emerge? And I think that critique goes to the heart, perhaps, of 
a possible weakness in governmentality as an approach, which is that although resistance is assumed, uh, otherwise there would be no form for governance, um, there, is very, there is in practice comparatively little work done on the way in which government and resistance uh, relate, to e uh, relate to each other. So that some of the researchers at the conference I was at recently were saying, well, well the, there is, of course, a, a huge branch of criminology that now tackles the questions of post-colonial subjects, but it still does so from the foundations of criminology because, in a sense, it is not possible to do otherwise. That in order to do otherwise, you have to start moving into other frameworks um, which, which will adopt, if you, if you want to put it this way, the subject position, the experiential position of those who are to be the subjects of the revised criminology. Um, so I think, in some respects, the question that is being raised here is about, and I think you did actually put it this way, what are the limits to this form of analysis? By, by in a sense, positioning itself at the level, level of the governmental rationalities, how far does it cut itself off from questions which become itself, uh, become themselves questions internal to its own discourse? So I could say, for example, that that unless you understand the specific forms and, and forms of consciousness that resist uh, a governmental rationality, you cannot fully understand how that rationality itself develops, what its limits are, um, and in particular, as I think you made very clear, how you can begin to develop a crit critique that is other than more or less internal to it. Um, so I'm acutely aware of that issue and um, have been trying to do similar work in Australia in relation to governmental programs to change the subjectivity of Aboriginal people. While at the, while at the same time, it's a classical liberal problem. How can we change the subjectivity of Aboriginal people so they can govern themselves better? While at the same time, allowing them self-determination. Uh, and that is a central conundrum for, for a liberal governmentality, which cannot be answered from within uh, a liberal framework. So the question which, interestingly enough, I've been trying to battle with is how can you produce that external vision um, without, in a sense, how can I put this? That, moving to that classical anthropological dilemma of without translating the resistant position into something that is comprehensible so that you can appear. So, so my response to this, I think, uh, very important um, contribution, is that it, it, to me, triggers a very major problem. Uh, and it relates to a problem which is not specific to Foucault's studies at all but is, is much more general to the question of the relationship between the knowledges, as you say, developed in the metropolis uh, and the knowledges which they seek to govern and the relationship between those knowledges. In, I, um, I really don't, I obviously don't have a simple answer to that, but I do think there are some promising leads. I mentioned the work of Brian Wynne um, who deals with the question of risk, a much tamer question than the one that Koshek has, has raised. But he deals with the question of how can we think about opposing visions, definitions, uh, and understandings of risk in relation to such issues as uh, nuclear contamination. And he looks at the opposing knowledges of small-scale farmers and universal experts. The universal experts come in and they say, here are the contamination risks, and the farmers say, no, no, that's not how it works here. How do you develop this? I myself have been working on how do Aboriginal people relate 
to changing systems of government that come in to tell them how to deal with the problem. In this case, gasoline sniffing, which is, of course, strictly speaking, a Western-imposed problem. Um, and also, at another level, how do you deal with the conflicting definitions of risk that are produced by drug-using subjects and those who seek to govern drug using. Now, these are much tamer questions, I think, than the, the ones that uh, Koshik is, is raising. But to me, they are quite explosive questions because they force you to perhaps start thinking uh, much more radically about the limitations of your own theoretical frameworks. Um, sorry, I, I'm probably going on longer than I should. Uh, other than to say, Yes, I'm, I'm a, I don't have a simple answer to your question at all because there isn't, I believe, one. Um, but I think it's an ex extremely important question which I'm trying to engage with. I'd say, if I, if I can just quickly say, of course the answer from within this discourse is, is precisely, you remember that little quote from the American Psychological Association that simply said, well, we can teach these people. We can train them. It'll work. Um, I think, Koshik, your paper was dense enough that we could open it up to the audience to follow up on either Koshik's, your comments, if you want to respond to Pat, or if anyone in the audience actually wants to address this before we move on to the next set of comments. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, as someone who works domestically only, um, in the sense of the subjects that I operate with. Um, it's interesting to see, I mean, in the context of both uh, the military warrior, right, and, I don't know, the carceral subject, that very similar uh, structural uh, forms of kind of historical context are there, right? I mean, so the, the military, I mean, the, the notion of the warrior, which is in some sense tied then to who is it that's uh, volunteering to be part of the uh, army in this country, right? Is, it's, 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 it's not clear to me that there is a fundamentally different, uh, a, a fundamental difference between the forms of economic, um, big economic factors playing in young kids who are joining the military in this country today, for instance, and uh, overall survivors. Um, nor is it clear to me that there are differences in terms of most of the young kids who are finding themselves incarcerated as to some of those. So, um, so the question becomes in what, in, in what sense the notion of subjectivity that is underlying the critique of resilience is not its, does not include its factors, including political economy already, um, uh, et cetera. So, I mean, so the, 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 the critique of the subjectivity um, would need to somehow uh, engage these multiple dimensions of uh, the production of the subject. Do you want to answer? Or? Um, I mean, all, all, all of your points are extremely well well taken, and of course, you know, I mean, it's it's easier to be a commentator because you can throw out impossible questions without having points. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but 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 it is. I, I mean, it's it's something that I'm wrestling with because it is it is sort of the problem space of the political within which I think all of us uh, are stuck. So. Um, I don't know, you know, well, I don't know how to answer the question of how do you want to construct the nexus between a kind of uh, analysis of political economy that you're implying and a, uh, an understanding of governmental rationalities. Is, am I getting you, am I misinterpreting what you're saying? Or that you... Well, I mean, I, my reading was that, um, I mean, my reading was that the forces shaping subjectivities here, uh, at least in 
townships research and, and Bhopal are dominated by issues of capital and, uh, and, uh, and economic um, conditions, right? Um, and so the question is, you know, how, well, how, do, we, how do we think about subjectivation? And, and is it different? Because I don't, I don't know. I mean, the notion of a post-colonial subject. Right? I mean, so that's. I, do, is the mass incarceration in the United States with one percent predominantly young African American men are these post-colonial subjects? Um, so that's the kind of that's the issue that I deal with because I'm more domestic. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the things that I picked up from the paper that I thought was very kind of profoundly interesting was, well, you need to look at the specificities of the situation. Now, the, peop the Aboriginal people with whom I was working who were resisting, in some ways resisting governmental projects um, on dealing with gasoline sniffing. Now, through a peculiarity in... Australian history, which sometime or other would be, I'd love to like, give a presentation on. These people come from an area which in a strict sense was ungoverned by uh, Australian colonialism, right in the dead centre, more or less, of Australia. Missionaries had hardly any influence. The government had hardly inf any influence. At that stage, no one had discovered that there were minerals there that they could export to China. There was little... Right, you, to go to this part of Australia now is like going to another country, another, another world. It is not the case, almost, that many of the subjects you are dealing with are even colonial subjects. That is, they are extensively, their, their world is extensively embedded, of course, changed in many ways by colonialism. But in in very many ways, not. Their structures of thinking are alien to, you know, to the colonizers and to myself. And so there is, pre there is a question about those subjectivities, which I think is, is vital, because even to think about the ways in which they are resisting requires a translation exercise. And I, you know, so again, going back to what I said earlier, for criminology to deal with this, it would have to make so many changes, it wouldn't be criminology anymore. And I think this is, for me, a question which is very immediate and very real. That if I look at the specificity of these people who are being taught a risk-based knowledge about the risks of sniffing gasoline, um, I cannot translate it into what, how they receive it. Um, it's hard enough for me to understand what they are saying, and mostly what they are saying is fed back to me through a translator, <laughs> uh, and so we go on. And I, all I can do is read it from a governmental position. Uh, and that, in a sense, not only glosses over the problem, but compounds the problem. That the only way to, to the only way I think that the kind certainly the kinds of analytic I am using and dealing with is is to understand those resistances, using that term very, very broadly, through the lens of the governmental, which already cannot uh, cannot understand how the resistance is being thought, imagined. Um, so to me, that is a big question. It's not such a big problem. Like with, with looking at the risks as drug users define them, I can go and talk to drug users and I can understand much of their rationality. Uh, but, but I think the problem, I think I can understand much of their rationality, is, is I suppose the answer. So I... I would say the question is, is a very difficult one. The assumption of the governmental regime, and it's very Benthamite, 
is that we can change these people from whatever they used to be into something better. And we don't know. We don't have to know what they used to be. Bentham wasn't worried about, or Bentham's inheritors weren't worried about, the precise subjectivities of those they were reshaping. They were barbarians. They had to be shaped into new subjects of liberalism. End of the question, really. So, sorry. I was just wondering, are you seeing anything in the Fort Bragg literature that, um, from the perspective of the, of the trainer, is responding to, you know, the, the, it's notorious that the U.S. military is bringing all kinds of people in who uh, several years ago wouldn't have made the cut, right? So uh, are you seeing anything in the literature that is seeing that either as a problem or as an opportunity, perhaps, when it comes to resilience? Well, it, it is a problem in the sense that you have to govern these people. You have to turn them into proper warriors. And so to the extent that your uh, program fails to do so, it simply sets up a new research problem. And the new research problem is, if it didn't work, then how do we make it work? So there's there, those, partly because it comes through cognitive behavioral psychology, um, there, there isn't a kind of Vestayan going on here. The approach is strictly, what are the techniques that we can deploy that will work, that will reach these people and will make them move from point A to point B? So again, the only way in which, if, you know, to, to perhaps beg a question and say, the only way those kinds of resistances to training can be dealt with is by more training and better training, is not to imagine that this project is misconceived uh, because that would be to take it outside of its own epistemology uh, and uh, perhaps even its own ontology. So the answer, you know, is in many respects uh, to all of the kinds of programs that, that I think are uh, lurking around in this discussion is the answer to government is more government. You know, government failure means government improvement. Uh, and certainly not very much a questioning of governance itself. In, in, certainly not in this sort of framework. No one goes back to CBT, for example, and says, oh, the entire epistemological and knowledge base of cognitive behavioral psychology is, is wrong, doesn't apply to these people, we have to develop something else. Not at all. You saw the quote. It said, resilience is some, not something that you're brought up with. It's not something that you develop out of your experience. Resilience is something we teach you. It's complete, completely there. We will make subjects out of you. And of course, in many respects, you can see exactly the same thing, going back to a term I'm increasingly uncomfortable with, the neoliberal governance of all kinds of people. For example, the unemployed that we will turn them into entrepreneurs of themselves. And to the extent that we fail is not an index of the failure of the idea, but only of a failure of the particular techniques that we have adopted. So, as they always say, more science needed. Okay, Tom. So, one, one issue I, I um, have always struggled with in this, in this kind of form of um, so the, the kind of ideas of subjectivation that governmentality uh, uses is that there's a presumption that it kind of works. And, and, and one of the, um, one of the things that I'm, I would be interested in, in hearing more about is actually what the materials of this resilience are in practice. I mean, okay, so, so we need a diagnostic of the rationality. But then when the rationality is put in practice, I mean, say, in a battle situation, what are the materials of resilience that are drawn on that aren't simply the, the ra reducible to the rationality itself, but are rather part of, say, the political economy of the military? And I think that this might be a, a point of connection with, with Kaushik's comments, too. I mean, I think that this, this quote, our bodies have died and are just living by our curse, that, that's actually, that, that is a, an amazing thing. It sounds um, completely like a traitor, <laughs> which is, of course, you know, something that I'm interested in. It, the futuristity is gone. You are just entirely in the present. Um, but, uh, 
but the, the difference for the poor call victims is that that's all they have, right? Or they have some recourse to, uh, to community political activism, like what you were describing, like throwing their bodies on the, on the trucks. But the warriors actually have much more materials for their resilience than just their courage. I mean, they have an entire battle apparatus behind them. So, you know, so I'm, I'm just wondering um, if we can th think about the materials of, of resilience uh, beyond simply the, the rationality, which is an you know, incredibly important component in the kind of organizational format of it, but the practice of resilience might show something more that gets into, that, that would expand it into the political economy domain. I guess there's two, two, two answers. Uh, one is, of course, from within this governmental framework, we would say, yeah, okay, we will go out and see what happens on, in the field. And what we see will be the basis for improving our resiliency training. Whatever we see, you know, it's like the, the previous question. Whatever we see is filtered through this governmental framework. So that position would be to say, if in fact we discover that people, in, that warriors in warfare draw on things that we haven't thought about, we'll build that into the project. That's not a problem. But your question seems to, is, is to say, as, uh, unless I'm misinterpreting it, but what is there outside of this government project? What happens that is not taken into account by it? Or well, it, I think that it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a question about the shape of the analysis. So the, it, government, so the people who are interested in resiliency are certainly interested in training. I mean, I, I completely um, you know, accept the story that, that you told. I'm just saying that analytically, if, you know, say you were to go into the um, into Afghanistan and follow around these resilient forces, what would you see that would be different from what the people who are trying to get the information to improve their resiliency models? What I mean that that, that these would be two different orders of of, uh, of knowledge because I mean and this is you know something a criticism that I have of, of, of my own tendency toward analyzing rationalities as well is that that you know the, there's a um, something that can be repetitive of and confirming of that rationality um, that I that we might be able to uh, to add more to. So that that was that was what I was. Oh, well, I must say the idea of being a field researcher in warfare has never <laughs> struck me as a particularly well, attractive proposition. But uh, uh, to me, I think that th that begins to raise this problem about um, the, an endless movement of governmental rationalities. So I won't see anything other than I, in a sense, my frameworks will lead me to see. The quick response to this is that I might see something uh, that the uh, rationality of resilience doesn't engage with. I might see, for example, you use the word courage. Now that doesn't come up, right? In fact, not only doesn't courage come up in these training programs, um, but in one sense, it is either thought of as outside to one side of it, um, or it's thought of as part of a mindset, which is a problem. So, uh, a, a couple of years ago, I wrote a paper that was precisely about the ways in which the traditional military way of thinking constructed failure in, in battle. What made people crack? And there, of course, was a huge literature going back to the, civil, well, the American Civil War and beyond into that question. And it had always been discussed inside of, in, in terms of a moral framework. That people had self-discipline, they had values, these were inculcated either somehow or other biologically or in early childhood. Um, there were theories about willpower which were fascinating. The idea that, that you have an amount of willpower inside of you. And that as you experience battle, that reserve is used up until finally, like, you know, it's like gas in the tank. 
until after you've been in so much warfare, you've got no gas left, you have no willpower left, and you crack. And they accepted that this will happen, and that's... You know. That kind of mentality, that kind of governmentality, because it was a governmentality, and it led to all kinds of struggles over, for example, the emergence of ideas about shell shock, which the military, traditional military, resisted uh, as a psychologistic piece of mumbo-jumbo, as, as making cowardice respectable. Um, right, that kind of mili traditional military vision, which was very much a classical liberal view, confronted the emergence of psycho uh, psychologistic and psychiatric models, um, and both of those frameworks are now confronted by CBT. So I wouldn't, you know, if I went in to see what was going on, I, my suspicion is I would probably resort to available repertoires of thought that are available to me through my liberal background and upbringing. And I would see brave people and cowards, which is exactly what the military governance traditionally took as its framework um, and, and still does. Um, so while we're talking, to me, one of the fascinating things that I would like to explore uh, is, well, not so much does this work, does this actually produce uh, network-centric warriors who are resilient, but what are the struggles that go on within military officer discourse about what is the truth? of resilience? Is it to do with courage in reality? Can we train people to be resilient? Um, I should say, another little background bit to that is, of course, the rise of psychology as a military technology is very prominent in military history. Um, and the struggles between traditional military and psychologists have been very much to the forefront. Um, and psychology itself has been engaged in a struggle. So, the, so even to talk about psychology right, as something unaffected by the military is wrong, um, but to talk about psychology as an entity is wrong because there is a huge rift between those psychologists, for example, who were part of the development of ideas like shell shock and then later on, post-traumatic stress disorder are not the same psychologists as the ones we are now talking, talking about with cognitive behavioural therapists who by and large reject PTSD and who certainly reject the psychiatric understandings of PTSD and say, well, but if we put resiliency training in, in place, we wouldn't get PTSD. And in any case, PTSD has to be understood differently. So, so, to me, there are, there are only the frameworks for understanding. And if I went into warfare, I would only see it through other frameworks, some of which are more accessible to me, some of which are simply not accessible to me, at least not just by going into the field. Uh, Koshik, did you want to make another point? Well, uh, maybe a quick, a quick response to, to some of the things on the table. I don't, I don't know if this is a response, but this is, this is going back to, to what um, Bernard said earlier. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, you know, it, it, it can be summarized by the question of, of, of in this conversation is very useful for me, the question of, of what I'm concerned with having to do, again, with this question of probing at the limits of the imagination of liberal subjectivity where limits both means the question of what is disabled to imagine and not imagine, but also limits in the case of that which operates at the edge of things, right? So something that is always there within this calculus, but, but just out of sight or on the margins or whatever. So, so maybe um, three quick points. The first is that um, when I absolutely agree with you that the post-colony is everywhere. And, uh, and I use the word, the post-colony, as a sort of shorthand, um, not wanting to get into the trap of using words like the subaltern that often end up becoming contentious words as well, because they have been something very specific and it's often not been used in that way. And, and the fiction that the post-colony doesn't exist within 
advanced liberalism. I think that myth has been blown. Certainly in the US, it was entirely blown open with Katrina. Um, having said which, it is the case that um, the multiple post colonies around the world are not able to automatically connect to each other in any kind of conceptual or political solidarity in the ways in which Wall Street, Dow Chemicals, and the Indian government seamlessly can so that Tom Friedman can proclaim that the world is flat. Um, and, and, and I do think that that differentiation is, is, is significant. The, the, the second thing here is I'm very interested in the question of, um, and this is the question that the Gayatri Vivek poses, which is, what of those subjectivities that are always sort of operating at the limit in a certain kind of way in that they are the obsessive concern of, in her case, colonial governance, and yet constantly fall out of it. And for her, the figure was the, the burning widow, the, the satin. Because for a hundred years through the 19th century, the British colonial administration is obsessed with regulating widow burning in all sorts of ways. And it ranges from then saying, this is a barbaric act and we have to apply our universality, to saying this is their culture and we can't touch it. And of course, if the women want to burn, then they burn. But, but, it's, but it's something that is actually integral to the consolidation of their rule in India, and yet always outside of it. And, uh, and so I guess for me that, you know, and, and so there's a certain way in which in medical anthropology, for instance, there is actually a figuration of the suffering subject as a certain kind of agential resilient subject. And I think here are Schwab Beale's account of Katharina in, in his book, Vita, which is a sort of very strong example of that. I don't mean for someone like Rashida Beale to operate there, because I, I don't, I, I, for me to say that would be too presumptuous um, based on the work that I've done. What, what I'm interested in is how these people all emerge as figures that are really at the edge of the imagination of liberal subjectivity. So that on the one hand, these people get constantly constituted as the conditions of possibility for a certain kind of global neoliberal governance. Um, you want to build capacity for clinical trials, the Indian government knows that it's going to be on the backs of people like these. You want to build industrial capacity, they know it's going to be on the backs of people like these. And yet, at some level, they don't matter. And so the last thing I'd probably say, this isn't something that can be quoted because it's double hearsay, but it's one of my biologist informants whose father was Milton Friedman's student in Chicago in the, in the 1950s. And Friedman visited, um, visited Pune, where he was apparently in the 60s. And, and my informant's father drove him from Bombay to Pune. And at one point during the drive, looked at all the slums on the road and said, but Professor Friedman, how do you account for all of these people in your economics? And apparently, and again, this is double hearsay, Friedman said, well, these people don't matter. And so th uh, what I'm really interested in is those people who get constantly constricted without mattering, and how, how we think about that, that subjectivation. I, I think, actually, in the interest of time, we should move on to our second respondent. Um, so Kevin Thompson is an associate professor of philosophy at DePaul University. His areas of specialization are German idealism, contemporary French philosophy, and the history of political theory. He has co-edited and contributed to the phenomenology of the political and has published articles on Kant, Hegel, and Foucault. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Thompson. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, Bernard and Unwin's uh, invitation to be involved in this. I'm a philosopher from the humanities. I'm from the old school. We don't do po uh, PowerPoints as much as you guys do. We have old style papers. I'll be reading from that. I'm also responding, as Kushuk was, to the uh, paper, the written version of the paper. That's doubly important in my case because the thing I want to focus on is actually something that you didn't mention in the, in the presentation. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a brief uh, reconstruction of the argument uh, of some of the paper, uh, and I'll try to identify the thesis I want to um, question a bit about. Right, so. We should just add that the paper is on the website. So I encourage you to read it. It's a wonderful paper. What does it mean to exercise reasonable foresight in the post-9-11 world? How is the conduct of populations and individuals, each and everyone, to be shaped and molded, to be rendered ever more governable, 
in a time where we are threatened by the prospect of such uniquely human-created catastrophes as global warming, global, ter global terrorism, and looming nuclear meltdown, to name but a few of our present dilemmas. If risk is indeed not a property of things, Francois Evol has said there is no risk in reality, but instead names, risk names a category and an, at and an attendant array of techniques that seek to render events in the world as a whole even fundamentally calculable and thereby make them accessible to various types of intervention, then it would seem that we are living, increasingly living, in, the, in a world in which the very threats at issue exceed the domain of the calculable, a space where probabilities are giving way in so many dimensions of our lives to bear inestimable, inestimable and radical uncertainties. <clears throat> what is most threatening for us now is not a set of risk, for the magnitude of catastrophe exceeds the domain of the measurable. What is most threatening, uh, excuse me, but how then are political rationalities to operate in the absence of a calculable future? Societies are still being administered, last time I checked. So how are we to be governed, and even to govern ourselves, with reasonable foresight, when that which confronts us, what is admittedly the extreme limits of our lives, global terrorism, global warming, uh, but that nonetheless shapes the mundaneity of our existence? How are we supposed to govern ourselves, govern one another, when that looks to be these threats are beyond valuation or assessment of any kind? From Risk to Resilience is an important contribution to these fundamental questions. In this work, Professor O'Malley offers us a profound and subtle sketch, I think, of several basic strategies of governance that have emerged, especially in the last decade. All of them, though in different ways to be sure, seeking to grapple with the dilemma of reasoning about and with uncertainty. At the core of each, O'Malley contends, is the problematic, and the brilliant formulation that he mines, this is in the written work, uh, that he mines from the 2004 report on the US National Commission on Terrorist Attacks of finding, quote, a way of routinizing, even bureaucratizing imagination, unquote. Which is to say the imperative for political rationality today is to think what appears, at first at least, to be the unthinkable. Political rationality must become a kind of fictive process, creating complex and intricate scenarios, narratives, that challenge and exceed the limits of not just what seems plausible, but what is even currently thought possible. And it must do this in ways that readily feed into the networks, forums, hierarchies, and feedback loops of information collection that are at the heart of modern bureaucracies. O'Malley insightfully analyzes for us three basic strategies and attendant techniques that seek to grapple with these dilemmas. So I want to rehearse the argument for us for just a moment and then focus in on one element of it that uh, was not in the um, presentation today, but it's very, I think, important. Those three, the, the three basic strategies are precaution, preparedness, and speculative preemption. So we've seen those. And he also locates a fourth approach, what we've been talking about quite a bit, resilience, that he claims has grown up alongside these bureaucratic technologies, but that importantly does not operate according to the logic of bureaucratizing imagination, but rather as a more truly neoliberal form of entrepreneurial governance, what he calls enterprising imagination. The key to drawing this distinction between the first three, that is between precaution, preparedness, and speculative preemption, and the last, that is resilience, is, o is O'Malley, argue, o O'Malley argues, the type of freedom that each seeks to inculcate. So this isn't in the public presentation, but I think it's important. Precaution, preparedness, and preemption all strive to forge an agent, whether as a citizen, a consumer, a family member, or otherwise, that is the contemporary embodiment of Bentham's thrifty, self-denying, diligent worker, the prudent risk avoider, what O'Malley sees as a form of negative freedom, freedom from. Whereas the techniques of resilience, on the contrary, seek to constitute those under and in its sway as Bentham's other favored model for the subject of true prudence, entrepreneurs of the self, what O'Malley takes to be a form of positive freedom, freedom too. O'Malley concludes, you didn't hear this in the public presentation, but I think it's important. O'Malley concludes, we should recall with a caution, resilience as a line of flight in an age of catastrophes may seem, and may in many cases be, innocuous, instilling us with, quote, optimism, resourcefulness, enterprise, and social networking, I would say in the face of radical uncertainty, 
is no bad thing, he says. But for all that, it is nonetheless still fraught, he claims, with all the dangers of reductive, crude, utilitarian calculus, of rendering human life nothing more than another form of utility, another kind of capital into which neoliberal regimes may invest and from which they may take opportunity to profit. Now, that's the rehearsal of the argument. Now, my principal concerns with Professor O'Malley's analysis really all revolve around the claim about the kinds of freedom that these strategies are said to instill. So I will leave it to my co-panelists, as we've already started here, and the subsequent discussions that we've been having, to delve into the nuances of his account of each of these techniques. I would instead like to provoke some further discussion of his thesis regarding freedom by briefly posing two questions. So the first has to do with whether or not Berlin's famous, infamous, model of negative and positive freedom is the most adequate or advantageous conceptual framework to get, to get at what I agree is a real distinction between precaution, preparedness, preemption on the one hand and resilience on the other. Negative freedom is, of course, freedom from external or extrinsic encumbrances or constraints. It's only historical reality, it has been argued, this is Orlando Patterson, is the liberation of someone from a condition of enslavement, but even this is contested. But this is really the form of freedom that precaution, but is this, this is my question, but is this really the form of freedom that precaution, preparedness, preemption seek to instill? Is each of those techniques not instead really a way of representing and managing uncertainty of reasonable foresight that enables those under their sway to make prudential choices? Consider again, for example, precaution. Take it in its most extreme quasi evaldian version. Imagine the worst possible, the serious and irreversible consequence that only a malicious demon could or would devise. O'Malley claims that this, quote, requires the curtailing or secession of action, unquote. Evald, it should be noted, has always said that precautionary practices result in the devaluation of enterprise, creation, and innovation. It is O'Malley says, quote, removing some of freedom by closing down enterprise and discovery in order to protect what is imagined as more important, unquote. But even if we accept the contention that precaution and preparedness and preemption as well curtails enterprise, which I think is contestable, but even, even if we accept that, why is this a form of negative freedom? Doesn't imagining the worst entail the pursuit of certain ends over and above others? And as such, is it not acting precisely not free from extrinsic encumbrances, but in service to the demands and dictates of utilitarian prudence? Why then would we want to call this negative freedom? Isn't it rather just another form of instrumental rationality, which, let us remember, is still a matter of setting and pursuing ends and thus a form of self-governance? That, that is what is typically said to be a model of positive freedom. My second question concerns the entrepreneurial nature of resilience. So I'm going to come back to some of the things we've just been discussing, but I think from a different uh, angle. If the technique of resilience is indeed, as O'Malley contends, a set of practices for instilling a mindset or a set of skills for thriving in and through chaotic uncertainty, a technology for constituting a truly non-neurotic subject, that is, I take it, one not governed in and through their own anxieties about the uniquely incalculable threats of the post 9-11 world, a strategy for constituting ourselves as true entrepreneurs of ourselves, then in what sense is this a constitution of a form of freedom too? Positive freedom. Resilience, we are told, demands of us that we embrace risk, that we see uncertainty not just as threat, but more fundamentally as, quote, opportunity and challenge, unquote. And that to do so, we must cultivate and exercise effective communication, decision-making, and goal-setting skills, and be open to learning from both our successes and failure in life, a whole range of effective and cognitive powers that purport to enable us to succeed in situations of radical uncertainty. Think of the Fort Bragg uh, list that you saw, the various components of that program of trying to instill these various cognitive and effective uh, capabilities or powers into the warrior soldier. But how exactly does, this develop, does the development of these, uh, these sorts of skills actually, actually constitute agents capable of investing in their own human capital? 
the core, according to Foucault and others, of the neoliberal model of subjectivity. Clearly, resilience is a process of learning new skill sets. I'm not disputing that. But they appear to be somewhat elaborate and perhaps even essential coping mechanisms for dealing with situations of extremely high uncertainty. None seek to develop, or at least this is my challenge, none seek to develop the risk-taking initiative and innovativeness that seems so central to entrepreneurship. But if this is correct, then they are techniques, it would appear, resilience, are techniques, it would appear, of surviving chaos and risk, but not of thriving and prospering from it. In this sense, they would be, at best, I think, necessary, but certainly not sufficient conditions, I'm a philosopher, of course we're going to go there, for counting as a true, that is under neoliberal conditions of acceptability and veridiction, a true entrepreneur of oneself. My question again, in what sense then does resilience seek to instill a distinctly neoliberal form of positive freedom? Now a final remark and then uh, uh, be done. Might not the danger of that form the danger of that form of neoliberal positive freedom, lie not, as O'Malley claims, in its utilitarian, he's following Dylan and, and Reed on this point, uh, lie not in its utilitarian reductiveness of human life, but rather in the fact that it instills a disposition of governance, this neoliberal positive freedom, instills a disposition of governance, governance that would deny us precisely the possibility of finding a way to forge ourselves in and through the political rationality of neoliberalism, creatively otherwise. This is the problem of resistance as I see it. That is, in a way that would affirm the generative core process of constitution and not just its docile products. Thank you. A slight feeling of deja vu. <laughs> Um, because I've just been sent by one of my uh, colleagues, uh, or two of my colleagues in Liverpool, um, Gabe Mythen and um, Sandra Walklate, uh, a paper which raises quite specifically the question about the, my overlooking of the prudential subject in uh, the models that uh, the risk-based models and the models of um, preemption and precaution um, and preparedness. And I think what I... Uh, I'm always happy to admit that I'm totally wrong because I'm always happy to do it because I'm quite used to it. Uh, and there's a very important point in here. I think I... I would want to suggest, or was, was going to suggest until the last part of your paper slightly pulled the rug under this, that if we go, go and understand the utilitarian prudential subject, if it, it has, say if we go back to Bentham's <laughs> writings, has two very clear trajectories. Bentham didn't see a contradiction in these uh, at all. One is the subject as risk avoider, and the other is the subject as calculative risk taker. Um, and the reality that Bentham writes about uh, is, is somehow uh, cleverly elided in his work, not, not deliberately. But if we focus on the Panopticon writings, then you can get the sense that the intention is to create diligent risk avoiders. These are people who, who have to be prudent. Um, they have to become modern liberal subjects, but the emphasis becomes much more on the docile subject, on a subject who is going to perform by habit, who will be obedient, and by implication, more than implication in his writings, thrifty, uh, and so on. It's about, it's about self-denial, deferred gratification, thrift, discipline in short, and so on. Um, in other parts of Bentham's writing, he's very clearly suggesting that the reasonable subject, the subject of foresight that he is trying to create, would be an entrepreneur. 
Um, so, for example, he argues that a society of abundance will emerge, providing governments keep the noses out of what they shouldn't interfere with. They should provide security. And security should be provided in order to create a calculable environment so that individuals can calculate and make plans uh, and profit from those plans. The tension in Bentham is resolved really by him having, I think, at different times, different actors in, in mind. Uh, and I think in some respects that this is nevertheless the case, and I think I would defend this in relation to things like preparedness, uh, precaution, I'll come back to your problem with precautions. Um, that, that in fact the subject created is nevertheless a risk avoider, is a subject who attempts primarily to minimise harms, not primarily the entrepreneurial subject. So I guess I would say, my, my response to this would be to say, well, the prudential subject always had both components within it at least in the, the, the utilitarian Benthamite subject, always had the risk avoider and the risk taker. But it was very clear to Bentham that these were different subjects. Uh, the entrepreneurs, we should all be entrepreneurs of ourselves, lay in the future after a certain societal base had been produced by the organs of discipline. Um, and I, I guess I, I could adapt to your critique by thinking that way. That I do think the emphasis in those uh, rationalities, those, those assemblages uh, that Engen Eisen refers to as being governed by a neurotic subject could be, seen, could be seen as governed by a prudential subject, but by a risk avoider. Um, perhaps not one who is seeking perfect security all the time. Perhaps Eisen's emphasis is a little strong on that. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's, it's about minimising harm rather than maximising opportunity. And I would have said, until I listened, um, with one of those slightly eye-opening realisations, to, to the last part of your paper when you pointed out that, well, in a sense, even if we were to accept that, resilience doesn't appear as a training to be an entrepreneur. It, as you said, it's primarily about coping strategies. I would, have, uh, I would question that a little bit. I would think there are some elements in that, in the Fort Bragg program, for example, which are about going beyond just coping. But I think there is a strong nugget of truth in what you're saying. And I think in some ways I I'm guilty of having read into the Fort Bragg program what I expected to find there. And I expected to find it there in part, you know, from reading Donald Rumsfeld. And I suppose your response would reasonably be, well, you, if you take him seriously, <laughs> you deserve every mistake you make. <laughs> um, so I would like, I think in light of your comments, I would like to go back to that analysis, which I won't do now, uh, um, I would like to go back um, and think about how far you're correct uh, that in fact arguably the resiliency project partakes still of the, resi of the prudential subject and is about uh, coping that there isn't much in there which there could be about what is enterprise and how do you do enterprising. And I say that because one of, one of the parts of my biography I rarely make much of <coughs> is that I was the deputy dean of a mega faculty of law and management. I was trying to impress someone once and I said over the phone, this is Paolo Malley, I'm deputy dean of law and management. And this German voice came back over the phone and said, law and management? We don't have any lawns. We don't need lawn <laughs> management. <laughs> sudden deflation. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was involved in the administration of courses precisely on entrepreneurship. And I, I, I think I always wanted to write a paper 
on how those courses were constructed. How can you instruct people to do entrepreneurship? It was always a mystery to me. Um, it's still a mystery to me. But I think what I'd like to do in relation to your comments, because I take that very, very, very seriously, is precisely that I would like to go and revisit um, what I have written about that Fort Bread program. In light of the same technical discourses on how you can teach people to be in enterprising and to look at the gaps and the silences and the distances. So I think that's a, a very, very valuable um, comment and perhaps I'll, I'll leave it there. Would you like to respond, Kevin? Okay. Chris? Um, I just had a, more of a clarification question or perhaps a confusion about the resilient subject. So it strikes me there's two concepts really that are at work. One is this idea of flexibility and one about integrity. And once I'm keeping in mind the military soldiers for the example, we think about it in the context of decision making. The former idea of flexibility is essentially about adaptation, a rational adaptation under varying information constraints where somebody will maximize or satisfy or something like that. But then there's also this element of integrity, which is the ability to absorb a trauma that would disable you from making a decision in the first place, sort of stop one from being paralyzed in the face of decision. And so what I'm wondering is these sort of this idea of flexibility and integrity to just use these terms seem to be sort of intertwined um, in your discussion of resilience. And each term itself seems to have a kind of um, uh, a different origin, and is this a fair characterization of the resilient subject that you describe? In the military, well, I would say um, there is a, there are brackets around the resilient subject, and those brackets are differently constituted by the settings in which the the resilient subject is to be realised. In the military, and I was just trying to remember as you were speaking the term that was used. But broadly speaking, the, the, what the military would say is that the resilient subject, the, the resilient warrior, always acts within the bounds of the military project. So in other words, the, the limits to their flexibility, the containment of their flexibility, is that they would have to be informed subjects. So, so that again, we have an element from a kind of neoliberal vision of empowered subjects. Unlike the old soldier who would just go there and blindly obey orders, the new warrior has an idea of what the aims of the military are um, in, this, in the particular exercise they're engaged in. So if I'm reading you rightly, the integrity, or at least the limits to flexibility and what makes puts the boundaries on flexibility and gives it its shape beyond the rather abstract notions that are in the resiliency training project, would be knowledge of the military aims and frameworks for that operation. So I don't know if I'm answering your question. Um, the answer, if we were thinking about the business sector, would be again in terms of the business frameworks. The, the difficulty, of course, comes up precisely in the um, 2008 fallout from the GFC, which is how do we tell the difference between what is excellent pushing of the envelope mm -hmm. and what is foolish risk-taking. Right. Now, in, in Britain, uh, another organisation that I've been very interested in, is there is now a development of a whole profession which is basically positioned at that border between what, what they call uh, warranted risk-taking and enterprise and recklessness. And the term is a term of art. That is, recklessness is defined in law. And it involves doing things with other people's money that was not consistent with a reasonable estimation, reasonable foresight, um, which of course you can immediately see as attention because the essence of the entrepreneur is nevertheless to say, well, you've got to push the neoliberal, you've got to push the enterprise, you've got to be flexible, you've, you've got to do things. But that creates a certain tension. In the military, that tension is 
supposedly resolved by the framework of the, the operation, um, and in the business, in the first instance, by the framework of the business in which you're operating, but in the second instance, because that has been proven by the GFC not to be sufficient, by a new set of state regulators who seem to me constantly on the hop, who try to negotiate the difference between responsible risk-taking and recklessness. So I, I guess, I think if this is an answer to your question, that's a tension, and it's a tension which is very real, um, but which is thought to be resolved within specific contexts by specific mechanisms. Can I open up to Francois? Yes, I am. I am not sure to well understand. Uh, I think this, this question, you have to, uh, to set up this question uh, in the story of risk and subjectivity. And that is not a modern story, it is a very long story. Especially, we can ask what was the job of the ancient school, moral school, for example, Stoician in the, in the antiquity, if not to produce resilience for people. That was, that was the purpose. The, the, the world was chaotic, the world was difficult, without possibility to, to match the event on the moral school, give tool to be resilient in this charge to observe the practice of government where the government say to the people, you have to be resilient. Maybe uh, we, we are um, normal, uh, the normal, uh, the government say, I am here to protect you. Is it possible that resilience could be a, a government, a government rationality, governmental rationality? That is my, what, what, uh, relationship between being resilient and what was uh, uh, the case at the, uh, in, in the 19th century that, that, that was not to be resilient but to be responsible. That was a big, a big duty to be responsible. What, what relationship between, between, between the both? Um, I think my, my last uh, uh, another remark. In the entrepreneurship, it, it, for me, it is difficult to see today entrepreneurship without risk and calculus. Because what is uh, allowed, what is forbidden, depends of the value of the decision, of the, the, the supposition, the hypothesis that is in the world of. Uh, business, all decision is calculable. And you, you have to choose the good decision is a decision which gives the, the most important benefit against, against his, his risk. And in this, res, in this respect, there is for me, uh, that it is difficult to understand a contradiction between risk aversion and entrepreneurship. In the story of us, in the story, if if you if you do a story uh, of risk and subjectivity, you naturally in the Middle Age you find, for example, the merchant. But what is the characteristic of the merchant? That is his risk aversion against who? Against the on dit le chevalier, uh, the noble. Le chevalier, c'est quoi Non, c'est un nom, je pourrais dire en anglais. Le knight. Le knight, oui. Le knight. Le knight a son relationship avec le Swiss. 
I don't know. That is not true that he, he, he has to be resilient. He has to date. He, he, he has to be very expensive in, in the, in the depends of his thoughts and, and so on. So, I, I think that the mention for me is the first that is one who introduced in his uh, perspective the role of risk aversion and the possibility and to calculate this risk, this, the, the value of this risk and the necessity to find uh, someone who takes this part of risk that is insurable, and, uh, especially in the maritime uh, uh, domain. So, that is, I summary it, I try. I think the question for, I think, that is very interesting to make the story, to make a story uh, of risk and subjectivity. And that is true that in our manner to uh, study risk, uh, with insurance and so on, the question of subjectivity was, was not in, in our scope. And that was one certainly, because there were a lot of resistance, for example, applicants against the, 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 the decision of insurance. There are four of this uh, story. That is very interesting. But what is exactly, what, what is the place, what place are we to, to give to resilience in this story on in the governmentality of risk, in the practice of governmentality of risk today? I think the critic would be that in your vision, you give too much place to, to resilience. And I think there is no contradiction between precautionary approach and resilience. I, maybe we have a, we, certainly we, we will assist to a, a new set of tools to cope with risk mm. on a part with a subjective aspect. Yes, yes, that is true. But that goes with other aspects where the calculus is not absent. Uh, quick, oh, a brief response. What a relief. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody. We're running over time. All right. Just, just very quickly. Workers. Actually, you know, uh, well, one point is what well, you raise about, in one sense, the history of risk subjectivities, um, which is a project that I have myself started out on, but um, I'm kind of imagining that retirement might come before I've got very far down that line. I think I would, I would want to, I think I accept many of the points you're saying, but I, I would want to defend myself against the claim that I am putting too much importance on resilience in the current framework. I'm rather trying to reflect the importance that those, pro, those promoting resilience uh, see for it. I myself am a kind of profoundly, uh, I have a, a a kind of now near pathological resistance to predicting the future. Um, and I certainly don't, I wouldn't say, well, resilience is the way of the future. Um, talk to cognitive behavioral psychologists and they will say, look, within five years, there will be nothing but cognitive behavioral science. There will be no, no longer psychiatry, it's pointless. Uh, there will be no longer all right. Psychoanalysis will have disappeared. Most other psychologists will have disappeared. We will rule everything. Well, of course, you hope not, but um, that's their projection. And, and I, when you read, it, when you go into the resilience literature, that is their projection, that this is the future. We will make everybody happy. Now, to me, there is a question which I think, you know, was, was coming up in your own uh, presentation, which is, well, this is very dangerous. You know, to me, to not that I believe this is the way of the future or that this is a, the major way in which uh, 
risk and uncertainty are being governed, but rather a deep concern, very deep concern, that supposing they're right, and supposing that these are technologies that do work, and that can convert us into these kinds of subjects, then what, how should we respond to that? How, should, how can we resist technologies, again, that appear for, to be for our own good? Who would, would not want to be able to resist catastrophic pressures? It, that seems totally irrational. <laughs> um, so to me, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely of the view that this is only one of the the projects. Um, that's why I was pushing at the beginning to say, well, there are these others that are developing. Uh, resilience is only one among many strands that is developing. There is a crucial need to investigate the subjectivities, and certainly in, and I accept all of these criticisms, that in this paper, those models of subjectivity are too crude uh, and need further refinement. But that the the question underlying those fundamentally is how should we respond to this new effort to change us into beings that will be improved in our own interests? And that, of course, is a standard Foucault question. Uh, it is the same old question, but in relation to a new technology. Well, but that, of course, is another question you raise. But Okay, and with that, can I thank our speaker? He's worked incredibly hard. Thank you.